of the largest auto markets in the world, three of them, the U.S., the European Union, and Japan, have been on a hugely volatile plateau or downtrend for nearly two decades with a crisis or two sandwiched in the middle. Over the same time, China has been on an uninterrupted surge since 1990, many years with double-digit sales increases that made it the largest auto market in the world. But in 2018, that fizzled, and not quietly, but with car sales suddenly plunging over the past four months, producing the first down year in the data going back nearly three decades. What was particularly disconcerting was the sharp deterioration at the end of the year in other markets, not just China. Each market has its own problems, but they're sure coming together at an awkward moment. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Wolf Richter of WolfStreet.com, and you're listening to the Wolf Street Report. It's January 20th, 2019. In the U.S., deliveries of new cars and light trucks in 2018 had started out pretty good, but then weakened in the second half. So in December, automakers pulled out all stops to move the iron and managed to push up sales by 2.2% for the month, which allowed the industry to eke out a gain for the year of 0.6%. But the 17.2 million vehicles that rolled over the curb, that was still below where sales had been in 2015. So that was three years ago. And looking back further, sales were below where they'd been the year 2000. So that was 18 years ago. The 2000 record was broken in 2015 and 2016, and it hasn't been seen since. Sandwiched between the records of 2000 and 2016 was the financial crisis. Over the two years between 2008 and 2009, new vehicle sales plunged 35%. GM and Chrysler went bankrupt and Ford barely escaped bankruptcy. Then there was a strong recovery driven by pent-up demand, but this recovery ended for GM, Ford, Fiat, Chrysler, and Toyota in 2015, and for many other brands in 2016. And now we're back in the reality of stagnating or declining vehicle deliveries. And that's in a strong economy, not a recession. When the next recession hits, which it will certainly do, auto sales will dance to an entirely different drummer. So with volume of new cars and light trucks in the U.S. down from the year 2000, what are automakers doing to show revenue increases? Yep, price increases. Or as the industry says, a shift to higher margin models. For example, compact SUVs, also called crossovers, are based on a car platform. They share much of the chassis, the drivetrain, and other major components. And the cost of building a car or a crossover on the same platform with the same powertrain are nearly identical. But the crossover can be sold for a much higher price because consumers are willing to pay that higher price. Then there are pickup trucks. They are immensely profitable for automakers because Americans are willing to pay a big price for a big piece of equipment, no matter how much it costs to manufacture. And over the years, consumers have shifted to higher profit vehicles, thus higher revenues and profit margins for automakers. That's the saving grace for automakers. And in their presentations to Wall Street analysts, automakers point that out incessantly. The problem with the sales model of going upscale is that automakers have lost their lower-end customers and are increasingly losing their mid-level customers. Ford has been on the forefront of this shift in the U.S., and more and more of its customers are shifting to used cars. Ford's new vehicle sales in the U.S. have been dropping steadily since 2015 and are now nearly back to levels of 2013. And yet, average transaction prices, which include all incentives, jump from record to record, as Ford proudly points out in its earnings calls. GM has done a similar job with similar results, and its deliveries in 2018 were just above those of 2014. Dollar revenues are up due to higher prices per vehicle, but the number of vehicles sold is down. The problem is this. Not everyone in the U.S. can afford high-end new vehicles, no matter how low interest rates may be and how long car loans can be stretched out. And by the way, interest rates have been rising. Let's throw Canada into the mix. 
new car and light truck sales started out in 2018 on a strong note in January and February at least, but then etched down on a year-over-year basis every month after that. But in September, sales suddenly dropped 7.4%. In November, 9.4%. In December, 8%. Those were very big moves. September was the worst September since 2014. November, the worst November since 2014. December, the worst December since 2013. These drop-offs in sales toward the end of the year pulled sales for the whole year down by 2.6%. In Japan, deliveries of passenger cars fell in December by 3% compared to December a year ago. In all of 2018, sales inched up by a tiny smidgen from 2017 to 4.4 million passenger vehicles, but were still down 6% from 2014 and 8% from 2005. So in 2018, sales were back what they'd been in, well, you got to stretch here a little bit, 1994. But between 1994 and 2018 were two events in Japan. The hard decline in sales starting in 2005 through the financial crisis and then the collapse in sales following the March 2011 earthquake and tsunami which brought sales to near zero for a while. These two events came back to back. So between 2005 and 2011, new car sales plunged 26%. Then they recovered, and now they're back where they'd been, well, 25 years ago. In the European Union, sales of new passenger vehicles dropped 8.4% in December compared to a year ago. It was the fourth month in a row of sharp year-over-year declines, including a hideous September, when sales plunged 24%. These last four months of the year wiped out the growth of the first eight months, which left sales essentially flat at 15.1 million vehicles. The European Automobile Manufacturers Association blamed this debacle of the last four months on the introduction on September 1st of new emissions and fuel economy testing procedures. Over the summer, there was a drunken party of discounting by automakers to get the maximum number of vehicles sold and registered before September 1st when the new testing procedures would become effective and unsold vehicles would have to be recertified. For example, last August, VW, which has nearly a quarter of the market share in in the EU, warned that only about half of its best-selling models in Germany were compliant with the new testing regime. And uh, the non-compliant units had to be sold before September 1st or had to be recertified under the new regime. So automakers plastered massive incentives on these models to get them off the lot by hook or crook before September 1st. In other words, they front-loaded sales. In June, registrations rose 5% year over year. In July, 11%. And in August, a whopping 31%. In September was hangover time. Registrations plunged 24%. But by early October, most of the recertification problems had been solved. For example, VW announced October 5th that all of its best sellers were compliant with the new regime. And yet, EU auto sales continued to drop relentlessly in a big way every month since. But there were some winners, including VW Group and Kia and Hyundai. The Korean automakers are particularly interesting. Combined sales in the EU have surged 68% since 2010 and blew past the 1 million mark in 2018 for the first time ever, leaving both Ford and Opel in the dust. Market share has jumped from 4.5% to nearly 7% over those nine years. Among the losers was Ford whose sales dropped again and are now down 5.5% from 2010. Over the same eight-year period, Ford's market share evaporated from 8.1% down to 6.4%. Then there's Opel, GM's former Marvel, which in 2017 became the Marvel of the French group PSA. Deliveries in 2018 were down 12% from 2010 and market share dropped from 7.4% in 2010 to 5.4% in 2018. Registrations in the EU at 
15.1 million in 2018, are still down 3% from 2007. So that was 11 years ago. And they're also down about 3% from the year 2000, which was about 18 years ago. Now the biggie, China. For the month of December, light new vehicle sales plunged 13% compared to a year ago to 2.2 million vehicles. The first half had been good, and sales had risen 6%. But then came July, and now there have been six months in a row of year-over-year declines with double-digit plunges over the last four months. September and October each down about 12%. November down 14%. December down 13%. These declines pushed light vehicle sales down 4.1% for the year to 23.7 million vehicles. And all of it happened over the last four months. We have to give special kudos to the U.S. automakers in China. GM sales dropped 10% in 2018 to 3.6 million vehicles, pulled down by a catastrophic 25% plunge in the fourth quarter. GM, also known as Government Motors, as it was bailed out of bankruptcy by the U.S. government, has heavily invested in factories in China and through its joint ventures now sells about 25% more vehicles in China than in the U.S. And it started importing China-made vehicles into the U.S., namely the Buick Envision crossover. Ford sales in China plunged 37% in 2018 to just 752,000 vehicles after a December collapse of nearly 60%. So it's got some work to do in China. In terms of overall vehicle sales in China, this is a totally new phenomenon, a year of declining auto sales. This just hasn't happened in the data going back to 1990. China's top-down managed, pump-primed, Growth, no matter what economy, with its massive government incentives, whenever there's a squiggle, has always produced relentless annual sales increases. Between 2005 and the peak, new vehicle sales multiplied by a factor of 6 from 4 million to nearly 25 million. The Chinese auto market blew past the U.S. auto market in 2012. By 2018, it was 40% larger than the U.S. market. But that sales plunge at year-end and the overall decline in 2018 show that the time of unfettered sales growth in China uh, is likely over and that China is facing the same problems in its auto market that other markets have faced for a long time, namely saturation, where after a recession, it can take 18 years or 25 years just to get back to where you had been. I'm Wolf Richter of WolfStreet.com, and you listened to the Wolf Street Report.